Hey everyone, Reese here and welcome back to Control Alt Reese. And in this video, we're going to be doing a bit of an updated tour of this room, my office slash man cave slash YouTube studio. Obviously, because of the events of the past year or so, I found myself working from home even more uh, than I had been before, and also with a bit more free time to be able to work on my YouTube videos and stuff. And this room's actually changed quite a lot um, since I did my previous tour back in March 2020. And I've had a few people ask me about it, so I thought, why not do an update? So here we go. <laughs> So as you'll know if you've watched the previous video, uh, this room's actually very small. It's uh, 2.3 by 2.9 meters, which is uh, 7 foot 6 by 9 foot 6. And it really is just a tiny little box room uh, in the house that uh, I own with my wife. And since I did my last tour back in March last year, um, I've kind of had a bit of a change of focus really with my, my collecting and my, my YouTube stuff. I found myself buying a lot of stuff um, just for the sake of it. And to be honest, a lot of it's in storage. Um, up in the loft and I've kind of started bringing that down and, and sorting it out and, and putting it up for sale on eBay and, and that kind of thing. And yeah, it's fun to, to, to buy the, the odd thing, um, you know, like the Acorn Archimedes or the Famicom or something that I don't really have any history with um, and play with that and, and make a, a YouTube video about it. Um, but ultimately, collecting wise, long term wise, you know, I want stuff that kind of tells my story and, and the story um, you know, of me growing up and, and the kind of computers and games that I enjoyed, uh, that I have enjoyed throughout my life so far and of course off into the future. So that's kind of the theme uh, and that's something that we're going to touch on a little bit more in the tour itself. But I think without further ado, let's get on with it. So one thing that I did change completely back in August of last year was uh, my storage situation in here. I'm sure you haven't failed to notice the uh, industrial blue and orange racking that kind of dominates the room now. And also this shelving that I've put in at the back here. Uh, and I had my cubby holes, as I used to call them, on the walls before, which were just like some cheap Argos um, storage unit slash display unit type things. I've still got those and you'll see that I've actually uh, adapted one of those into a, into a bit of a project and a bit of a storage thing uh, which I thought was quite cool and quite interesting and we'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, but of course I thought the logical place to start would be here at the desk where I film my videos. So at the moment I've got my STE set up. Uh, this is my actual childhood Atari STE. Uh, I got this for Christmas back in 1991 when I was seven years old. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of pretty much permanently set up on the desk here because it is probably the most important computer in my collection. Um, I also have the Discovery Extra. That's an actual um, Discovery Extra box there, which is the pack that I had as a kid. I also tracked down the original discs that came with it. Uh, and that box was very kindly donated to me by a viewer of the channel uh, and a patron of mine was. Uh, thank you very much, was. I know I've thanked you multiple times in multiple videos for that. Uh, but obviously, as you can see, it does have pride of place on the wall and, and it is it is important to me. So uh, it's really nice to have that there as part of that display with that computer. Uh, the other obvious thing here, of course, is my video music clone. Of course, that doesn't live there. That's just the last project that I finished a couple of days ago. That's the last video that I put out. So that's a clone of the Atari Video Music, which is a, uh, a music visualizer from the 1970s that Atari made. So uh, yeah, you plug it into your hi-fi and into your TV, uh, play your uh, wacky psychedelic 70s music, and it makes wacky psychedelic 70s patterns appear on the screen. And just the other thing that we have in the PC spot here on the desk, as I like to call it, because this is where I tend to put the uh, PCs that I'm working on, uh, which is kind of the other big passion of mine other than Atari, we have the IBM 5162. Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this was an original uh, IBM 5150 PC, uh, but it's not. It's the 5162, which was actually a 286, so a uh, an AT class PC in an XT style case. Uh, it's known, also known as the XT model 286. And this is going to be my next project, I think. Um, this has a 6 megahertz 286 CPU in it. But I want to strip this down. I've barely looked at this, to be honest, since it arrived. And I really want to do it just this and strip it down, um, build it up into a, a kind of a 286 era gaming machine. Uh, see if I can overclock it. I know uh, Adrian Black has been doing some work very recently on a the similar 5170. Unfortunately, it's not exactly the same motherboard, so I'm not sure if the same principles apply when it comes to overclocking and upgrading it. Uh, but yeah, it's, a, it's an AT class 286 machine, so it should be nice to work with. Uh, and it will be interesting to learn a bit more about the history of this 
computer as well because obviously it's quite a quite a rare machine uh, and one that not a lot of people have heard of. I've also got my Model F keyboard here. This is the XT Model F keyboard that goes with my 5150. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with this computer. Um, I have it here because it looks the part, but um, I'm going to have to track down some kind of um, XT to AT adapter or something to be able to hook that up or, or possibly even a, a an AT version of the Model F. The Model F is the correct keyboard for this machine. Um, so I'd really like to get one just because I like to have full sets of stuff that matches. So just very quickly, we'll have a look at the back wall here and just a couple of things on here before we move on to the slightly more interesting stuff further up. Uh, so I have my uh, Sunnyvale Heavy Sixer Atari 2600. That's the original NTSC model. That's one of the first production run. I imported that myself uh, from California. Uh, it's got a uh, UAV mod in it, which is a really cool video output mod. Uh, and I do use that all the time, actually. That's a really nice, really nice machine uh, just to play on and, and still holds up very well today. Uh, and kind of one of my favorite things, uh, one of the things I'm kind of most proud of in my collection, uh, hence it has pride of place uh, in on the back wall and in every single one of my videos. Uh, I've also got, uh, that's a Japanese laser disc there, obviously that's Alien. Um, I've got a bit of a collection of those. Uh, the plan originally was to have them kind of on the walls, um, on display, um, in these kind of LP frames. Um, but to be honest, I don't have all that much wall space in here and it's kind of all been taken over by other stuff, as I'm sure you can see. So I had to compromise and just basically uh, pick one and just kind of occasionally rotate it. Uh, next to that, that is a Famicom Disk System poster. Obviously that's for Zelda. Uh, the original Famicom Disk System version and uh, Famicom games as you'll see is one of the things that I collect and also the Disk System games and the Disk System units themselves actually came with these game posters in the box uh, so that's an original one of those. Uh, just a couple of other things, a couple of uh, things for my uh, fellow RMC Discord members, uh, instant MIDI upgrade stickers, that was uh, part of the RMC Secret Santa, that was my gift from Pillock, thank you very much Pillock, uh, and also a nice picture from uh, Rich of uh, Elmo and a uh, Christmas elf, and uh, yeah that's, that's also me in that picture. Uh, so thank you very much Rich, and you'll see that actually came as part of a donation uh, to the channel which I'll show you slightly later on in this video. So let's move up to the next level up and see what we have up here. So this middle back shelf here is uh, kind of a, more of a recent addition uh, and the purpose of this shelf is really to show off some of the things that, I, that I've covered on the channel that I'm kind of proud of. Uh, stuff like the Atari 260 ST, I made a couple of videos about that that were very popular. Uh, really interesting machine, obviously a very very early example of an Atari ST, in fact the very first run of Atari STs. Uh, also the uh, Neo Geo stick here very early on in the history of my channel I made a series of videos called One Joystick to Rule Them All where I built a series of joystick adapters to connect the Neo Geo arcade stick to various different machines. Um, also of course one of my favourite joysticks of all time, really lovely thing to use. I don't own a Neo Geo console and I don't know if I ever will um, but it's just nice to own the joystick. I also have the other model, the uh, Kidney Bean style Neo Geo joystick as well. Moving along, some Atari calculators, that's something I want to cover on the channel at some point in the uh, in the near future. Uh, I don't think they were actually manufactured by Atari, I think they were produced under license, but uh, there was quite a range of those and I've been picking those up over the past couple of years and uh, I think that would be a really interesting topic uh, to cover in a video. Auric Atmos, uh, this was featured on the set of the IT Crowd, I won this in a charity auction a few years ago. One of the early videos on my channel was about this particular Auric Atmos and uh, yet again another one that was that was quite popular uh, quite popular with people and, and seemed to go down quite well and also again one of my favorite machines in my collection hence it has pride of place and then my doom figures which just basically represents my love for all things id software and all things doom um quite whether i'll make a video specifically about doom at some point in the future i'm not sure um quite possibly but uh, just love those things and i think they look really cool there on display so while we're on the subject of my favourite things that I've covered on the channel so far and my favourite videos that I've made, we have my Sparrow prototype. So this is a prototype of the Atari Falcon 30. Uh, it's a genuine ex-Atari engineering prototype. 
Uh, I put out a video back in November last year where I took a close look at this. I did a huge amount of research uh, just looking up the uh, all of the custom chips and things that uh, were once on it. There are some working examples of these out there, uh, obviously this is not one, and there was a whole debate at the time about whether I should rebuild it or whether I should just keep it uh, just as a, as a wall ornament. As you can see, so far I've gone with the wall ornament option, although it has also uh, gained a CPU and some RAM. And I've also tracked down some more of the custom chips for this. Uh, I don't really have any immediate plans to rebuild it. And to be honest, I told the story of, of how these were kind of cannibalized for parts in that video. Um, and a lot of people seem to agree that uh, um, that rebuilding it would, would kind of erase that, that history. Um, you know, it, it tells a story in its current state uh, and that trying to rebuild it to kind of be brand new and working, while it would be a very interesting engineering exercise and of course should be, should be perfectly possible, uh, it's probably better left as it is as a historic artifact. And I think at the moment uh, and so far, I, I'm inclined to agree with that. And that's also the easiest option, which is uh, always a good thing. And just above that, uh, I have my Astro City control panel. I was just going through a spree of buying things on Japanese auction sites and just thought, wow, you know, how cool is that? An actual, from an actual arcade in Japan. And next to those, what appears to be just a random multi-tech modem. Uh, this is actually the very first modem that we had as a family when I was a kid. Uh, and my very first online experiences uh, were as a result of this modem going on the, the AOL chat rooms and stuff back in, uh, I think it was kind of 1995 ish uh, on a, on our 486 PC running Windows 3.1. So I found that in a box when I was uh, clearing out some stuff at my parents' house and just thought, yeah, you know, as considering I am a, uh, a developer in my day job now, and uh, of course, a huge amount of my life is spent online with the YouTube channel and everything else. That's kind of a really important part of my my backstory and my history, really. Uh, my very first experiences going on the internet. And I'll probably use that at some point in the future, uh, just to put together a video about those kind of early days of the, the 90s on the internet, um, just to, you know, just to make sure that that's all documented. <laughs> The idea with this shelf was that this was going to be in shot in my actual videos. The trouble is, with it being such a small room and with the lens on my phone not being a particularly wide, a particularly wide field of view, uh, this stuff just doesn't fit in the shot, so uh, you never get to see it. And if you've seen my video on my second channel about my overhead filming rig, uh, that usually fits across here. Um, so that's usually in the way anyway. Obviously, I've taken it out to record this video. So just to kind of uh, go over some of the stuff that we have on the top shelf here, uh, the Atari 2600 Junior is actually the console, not this specific one, but uh, the 2600 Junior console uh, was responsible for my very first gaming experience, or certainly the very first one that I can remember, uh, which was at my cousin's house one Christmas. Uh, and it must have been a couple of years before we got the ST. Uh, so obviously I had to pick one of those up. I have my Harmony cart there, which is the flash cart for the 2600s, and that's uh, obviously loaded up with the uh, complete set of games for that console. Uh, dotted about up here, I have some Lynx games. Um, by no means a collector of those, but I just picked those up uh, relatively cheap on eBay. Um, I need to do something with those really. They're just kind of shoved up there out of the way. I do have the Lynx, which I'll show you in a moment. But one thing I do have up here, which I am particularly pleased with and particularly proud of, is my Atari 5200. Now, not many people know about the 5200, and that's because it was particularly short-lived, which is a shame, because I think it was a great console. Uh, it was let down by its controllers, which were uh, kind of notoriously bad, although, of course, Atari could have changed those at some point, but uh, they just decided to pull the plug and cancel the whole thing instead. And the 5200 is based on the same architecture as Atari's 8-bit home computer line. In fact, it was originally going to be released as a replacement for the 2600 uh, back in 1979, and Atari changed their minds and said, no, what we're going to do is turn this into a computer instead, and turned it into the 400 and the 800, and then they sat on this for a while. And I want to put a video together telling the story of this console. Um, purely because of that whole inner sort of conflict thing at Atari, and I think it's quite an interesting story uh, just about how uh, their gaming division and their home computer division didn't really see eye to eye on that decision. Uh, and when the 5200 did eventually come out, um, the home computer div division basically forced them to make some changes to it uh, that would mean that it wouldn't be compatible with the 8-bit home computer software without uh, 
without uh, rewriting it slightly. Uh, and as it happened, that's just a case of repointing a couple of memory addresses, and that's it because it is literally identical hardware apart from that. So interesting story. Uh, I also have this Pac-Man prototype cartridge. I love prototype stuff. Obviously, it's very rare. Um, so this is a a prototype of Pac-Man for the 5200 and that's going to be a video that I'm going to be making very very soon uh, just having a look at that cartridge and hopefully trying to dump the ROMs from it and seeing what's on there and whether it works. No spoilers but uh, hopefully that should be a really interesting story to tell. So just moving along just a few more interesting bits and pieces. Uh, the joysticks, I've uh, got a nice collection of Atari joysticks so I, I like to pick those up whenever I see them. Uh, quite a few different designs on those boxes over the years. There's also the keyboard controllers up there the box for my 2600 Heavy Sixer and obviously some games as well. Um, so that's the original box that that came in. It's not the ultra rare chess piece box, it is the uh, slightly later version, but still a very early, very early example. Uh, my Pong machine, this one's been composite modded by myself. Um, that's something that I want to do a tutorial on at some point in the future because that's quite hard to find the information on that one. Uh, and that is the original uh, C100 Pong from 1975, which was Atari's first. Uh, sort of home TV console, so uh, interesting piece of history that. I also have the Super Pong, which is the second model of Pong that came along, uh, and that's probably the one that I'm going to be using for the tutorial uh, when I put that video together. As you can see, I also have the Touch Me. That's uh, something that uh, I covered in a very early video on my channel, just having a play with that and having a look at that. A very interesting little handheld console. So one thing that a lot of this stuff has in common uh, is that it was all imported from the US. So indeed the uh, 5200 wasn't even released here. Uh, the Touch Me also uh, was a US exclusive and the Stunt Cycle. Uh, the Pong machines, I think they did release those in the UK but they just didn't sell particularly well over here. So these are all kind of US imports, uh, as is my VCS. Um, the Stunt Cycle is quite an interesting one. That's an early dedicated TV console that Atari made. Uh, based on their arcade game of the same name of course uh, and that's a game that was created I think that was 1977 ish that was released um, and that was created to cash in on the whole kind of daredevil stunt stunt motorcyclist uh, evil Knievel craze of the 70s uh, which is obviously huge in America at the time uh, really interesting game that that's RF only and it's uh, it's NTSC uh, so that's another one that needs to be modified, but I think that's quite similar on the video side of things to the Pong machine, so it shouldn't be too complicated. I have stripped that down uh, and had a look at it, and it is in absolutely immaculate condition. It's basically brand new inside that box. I don't even know if it was used or um, perhaps uh, someone, some kid got it for Christmas back in, uh, back in the late 70s and played with it for five minutes and shoved it back in the box and that was it, but I don't know. Um, but yeah, so that will be a really interesting one to take a look at. So in this corner I want to start with something that was actually quite an important part of my childhood and that was my original joystick. So here I have my Wico command control joystick and that's the actual one that I had with my Atari ST when I was a kid and I managed to hold on to it for all of these years. It's still working great, I still use that, uh, I still use it even today when I'm playing on some of my old Atari consoles and stuff, it's still a really great joystick. Uh, as you can see there's also my Atari 7800 collection here, um, a later Atari console, late 80s. Um, that was uh, very similar technically to the 2600. Essentially all they really added was an upgraded graphics chip. Um, not one of Atari's finest moments in my honest opinion, um, but a very cheap console to collect for and graphically some actually quite good arcade conversions on that system. Um, and if someone's looking into getting into collecting uh, old consoles and uh, old games and, and Atari stuff, uh, I could actually recommend the 7800 because it's, it's quite a a cheap system to collect for and uh, still quite a lot of decent quality boxed games around for that one. And just tucked away up in the corner there uh, is an original Atari flashback console which is one of the very first examples of uh, plug and play TV consoles from kind of the early 2000s. Uh, kind of kickstarted the whole uh, mini console revolution that we still have going on today. And the interesting thing about that is that uh, it's not even based on the 2600, uh, it's actually a, a NES on a chip or NES on a chip uh, Nintendo compatible console and uh, it, it was somebody's job to port all of the original 2600 games or at least the uh, 20 that they have preloaded on this console uh, to the NES just so they could have versions that would run on that. Um, I wanted to go over that, that is something that I did actually specifically buy for the channel and I wanted to go over that and uh, just compare the games to the originals and see you know, how similar or different they are uh, and it's just something that I haven't got around to yet uh, but it's uh, quite an interesting thing, quite an interesting story and just tucked away behind that is a 
Ultra Pong Doubles, which is a slightly later example of a Pong machine. Uh, this one I bought um, boxed without really uh, seeing what the condition was like, but it had quite severe battery damage. Uh, in fact, the original uh, early 80s batteries were still inside it when I got it and uh, the motherboard was, was incredibly badly corroded. So I'm not sure if that's repairable or if I need to find another one of those so that I can strip down uh, so I can use the, the motherboard from that. But that, that project's kind of on hold at the moment. Just to round this off, we've got the XEGS here, which is uh, Atari's consoleized version of their 8-bit computer line. Uh, I also have another one of those on display on the shelf, which I'll show you shortly. Um, but a really great console that, I love the styling on it. And it also came with a light gun, which was very cool. Um, it does have a keyboard with it, and because it is compatible with the 8-bit computers, you can use all the modems and printers and disk drives and even tape drives and stuff with it um, that, that were also compatible with those 8-bit home computers. So uh, a bit of a, a bit of an oddball, that, for a games console, and a very interesting thing. Um, next to that, as you can see, the Dragon 32, uh, completely unrelated to Atari, but it is from my homeland of Wales, my ancestral homeland. This is a computer that I covered on the channel not all that long ago, uh, just telling its story and, and seeing what it was all about and trying out some of the most popular games on that computer. Uh, I was really proud of that video, I thought that was definitely one of the uh, better ones if I do say so myself. Then just a couple of bits and bobs, the uh, excellent Art of Atari book um, and another book all about collecting Atari stuff that I picked up at some point, I think that one was from a charity shop actually. Um, the 5200 trackball controller for the Atari 5200 console. Uh, really cool controller that is, a proper kind of heavy duty uh, arcade quality trackball controller for the 5200. More than makes up for those rubbish controllers that actually came with it, uh, but unfortunately it's not supported in all games or, or doesn't really work well um, in, in all of the games on that system, so it's not a complete replacement. Um, so Mr. Drillers, as you know, Mr. Driller, one of my favorite games of all time, something I've made a video about in the past. Um, Puckman game, that's a silly little thing that I imported from the uh, Japanese auction site. Um, I'll, I'm sure I'll probably uh, make a silly little video about that at some point. And uh, I think we shall move down to the Jaguar and Lynx section next. So just framing this section are these wonderful Atari Hot Wheels cars. Um, I have no idea why I put these here. It was a very stupid decision because they're right next to the desk and I'm constantly hitting them with my elbows. And a few of these have even been knocked off the cardboard backing a few times and had to be glued back together. Uh, thankfully, you can't really see that they've been repaired, but uh, I should probably find a safer spot for those. But the main focus here really is the Jaguar, or the Jaguar, if you prefer, uh, which was the last ever console that Atari released, of course, back in 1993. And uh, this was kind of, this kind of means a lot to me because I saw it advertised in the Atari ST magazines a lot when I was a kid. Uh, obviously, we got our ST in '91, and this was uh, released in '93. So it, there's there's that overlap there. And I really, really wanted one as a kid because the marketing really pushed it heavily as uh, you know the next big thing and this revolution in 3D and, and VR gaming was kind of the the buzzword of the day. They did actually make a, a VR headset for this, um, although there's only a couple of them in existence, uh, basically prototypes. Um, but would be a very cool thing to own. Um, obviously, uh, bucket list kind of stuff. But um, yeah, as well as as well as being a console that I always wanted as a kid, uh, the Jag Jag's also important to me because when I first started collecting uh, Atari stuff 20 years ago, uh, it was one of the very first consoles that I collected for. Really, uh, back in those days, you could buy the console for sort of 20 or 30 quid, and that was brand new in a box. Uh, and you could buy the games for like two or three quid, um, sealed brand new in boxes. And so I picked up quite a lot of them and people bought me them as presents and, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and then I went to university and I was a poor student and I sold the whole lot um, for not a lot more than I paid for it. And uh, in the past couple of years, I've had to start buying it all back again. So the moral of that story is to never sell anything. And uh, yeah, then one day you'll be like me with a whole room rammed full of stuff. Um, 
yeah, so perhaps uh, perhaps don't take that advice. Also on this shelf, the infamous Atari Lynx, of course, fantastic handheld console, um, developed by Epix, actually, a gaming company that was quite big in the 80s. And there, there's a really interesting story there, as there is with a lot of Atari stuff, uh, just some really dodgy business wranglings and things uh, that meant that Epix basically ultimately uh, ended up going bust as a result of developing this console for Atari. And Atari picked up the rights to it uh, and all of the games for next to nothing and then of course slapped their slapped their logo on it and sold it for a lot of money and that was actually uh, quite a quite a good console um, two revisions of that that is the later Lynx 2 I don't have one of the earlier ones but uh, maybe something that I'll have to pick up at some point in the future uh, and yet again the reason for having that is because it's something that I saw advertised a lot when I was a kid it was around that kind of era and last, and definitely by no means least on this shelf, is the Atari 2800. And the 2800 is the Japanese version of the 2600. Uh, and they didn't sell many of these at all. Atari weren't popular at all in Japan. Um, and the stuff that uh, they made specifically for the Japanese market is very rare now. Uh, of course, this is one that I've imported. Uh, it's in its original box with the manuals and everything else. Uh, and the interesting thing about this console is that uh, the joysticks uh, were actually joysticks and paddles together. So uh, the joystick part works as an actual joystick, but then you can spin them around and use them as spinners as well for uh, uh, all those paddle games that were on the 2600. So really interesting console that, and definitely something that I want to cover in a future video uh, and just tell its story because I think it's a, it's a, a very cool piece of Atari history. And just tucked away in this corner behind the PC, uh, but by no means forgotten about, is my Atari Mega ST. Now, of course, the Atari Mega ST was the professional version of the Atari ST. Uh, came in a desktop form factor, a really nice piece of design. Uh, as you can see, I've got the Megafile hard disk. Uh, I've got a uh, third party hard disk here made by a company called Progate. Uh, and I also have the SMM804 uh, dot matrix printer, which was actually manufactured by Epson uh, and uh, Atari branded. And uh, I actually use this computer when I want to capture footage of Atari games and software because uh, the video output on that is, is really nice. It's really, really sharp and really good quality compared to the other STs that I have. Um, and also it's set up to be really easy to switch between the internal floppy drive and an external GoTech. Uh, and also I can use my Ultra Satan um, hard disk emulator with that. So really nice all round, a really versatile uh, example of the Atari ST there. Um, yeah, really great machine and also one that has featured on my channel a fair few times over the years. Uh, probably the most famous example being my uh, Sandstorm video. <laughs> So another system that has some personal connection for me and another system that I collect for, uh, of course, is the original Xbox, as I very briefly mentioned earlier. And this is my actual Crystal Xbox that I got uh, back in 2004-ish. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, who's actually now my wife, uh, bought this for me uh, for Christmas, which was uh, very, very kind of her. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, so most of the games that I have here for the original Xbox were actually my originals that I owned back in the day. Uh, the only extras that I've picked up really are the launch lineup, the PAL, PAL uh, launch lineup uh, from here in the UK. So any of those games that were released in the first week of the Xbox's launch. Uh, specifically bought those because I want to cover those in a video um, like a lot of the stuff I have here and uh, on that note I also have the Xbox HDMI modification which is an internal upgrade for the Xbox which adds HDMI output and upscaling uh, I think it's recently been rebranded to the Xbox HD plus or something like that um, but that's also something that I'm going to cover at the same time um, and of course a fantastic excuse to get back into the original Xbox and revisit some of those games that I used to play in my kind of college and university years so uh, very much looking forward to putting that one together. Now the other thing that I'm sure you've spotted uh, just in these lovely custom shelves that I made from the remains of my old cubby holes uh, are my big box PC games and uh, a lot of these games are, well most of these games in fact are games that I played uh, growing up back in the day so they're all kind of uh, 90s and, and very early 2000s kind of titles when I was into PC gaming. They're not my originals uh, I should say um, unfortunately, uh, although I do have a lot of the original CDs and stuff from those days, uh, we'd never held on to any of the boxes. Uh, with that said, I think Ultimate Doom, I have two copies of that um, because I bought one a few years back and then actually found my original one. Uh, and I think Quake is also 
Uh, that's also my original one from uh, brand new. But apart from that, uh, like I say, it's all stuff that's kind of been rebought to try to uh, relive that experience. The exception to that, and one thing that I really wanted to point out in this video, uh, and just give a really big shout out to someone because I haven't actually acknowledged it on video yet, uh, which is really bad of me because I, I like to uh, I like to uh, at least thank people personally in my videos for any donations to the channel and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, one thing that I really wanted to mention in this video uh, were the Screamer games, which were incredibly kindly donated to me uh, by my good friend Rich. Uh, so thank you very much, Rich, for those. That's really, really, really generous of you. Um, I covered the original one in my S3 Verge video, um, and then off the back of that, um, we had a bit of a conversation about how I'd never played the Screamer games before, and he said, you know, you know some of the best examples of DOS racing games, which of course I have since discovered and uh, since come to appreciate. So my big box PC games and uh, pretty much the story of my teenage years laid bare there uh, for all to see on that shelf uh, and a really nice uh, nostalgic reminder for me as well. On the next shelf down here, uh, pretty much the same story as per the PC games, I have my Atari ST games and uh, yet again most of these aren't my originals from back in the day. Uh, a few of them are but uh, they're basically a representation of some of my favourite games on that system. Uh, back in the day, of course, um, perhaps uh, not all of the games that I had were legitimate, shall we say. Uh, some of them were on uh, menu discs and stuff like that, uh, as was very common with those home 16-bit computers at the time, like the Atari, Atari ST and the Amiga. Um, but now I'm atoning for my sins by buying them all back. Of course, the original publishers won't get a single penny from all of these second-hand eBay sales, uh, but it will help me to sleep at night if I keep telling myself that. Uh, so just a few personal favourites here. Uh, I've got the complete collection of Bitmap Brothers games, um, Magic Pockets, Gods, uh, the Xenon games, Chaos Engine, Speedball 1 and 2. I've also started picking up the Dizzy games, of course. Uh, really great games on those 8-bit and 16-bit machines. Uh, Treasure Island Dizzy was a particular favourite of mine when I was a kid. Uh, in fact, I don't think I really played the others at the time. Um, so it's been really great to pick up that series on the ST. You don't really see these for sale all that often. Uh, the boxes are quite small and kind of fragile and uh, just uh, not very common games to come across. So it's always nice to pick one of those up when I see them. I remember them actually selling these at Toys R Us uh, and uh, my dad occasionally taking me to Toys R Us and, and kind of picking them up. And the great thing about these games at the time is that they were kind of slightly older games uh, that were being sold for a little bit cheaper so uh, I could spend my pocket money on them. And uh, that's the way I experienced a lot of the, uh, the legitimate games that I owned on the ST uh, through that budget label. So uh, that's another thing that uh, there's very very little interest in collecting and uh, when you do see them for sale people just basically can't give them away but uh, to me they actually have a lot of nostalgia value. And then just a few more games here on the end just yet again representing some of my childhood favourites. So we've got Nine Lies, Batman, uh, Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters and Ghostbusters 2 um, and uh, Rainbow Island, SimCity. Uh, and a few others and uh, yet again all of those games are, are kind of hand-picked because they're games that I enjoyed as a kid. So now just moving on to my little acorn corner here uh, and we have a BBC Micro, I think it's probably the most obvious uh, thing I have here in this corner uh, and this machine is something that will be very familiar to British people of a particular age uh, because for a lot of us it was our very first experience of using a computer because they were in British primary schools uh, throughout the 80s and actually a lot of primary schools actually held on to them later on into the 90s as well. Um, but a really fantastic 8-bit machine, uh, uses the 6502 CPU, same as the Atari 8-bit computers, uh, the Commodore 64. Uh, really uh, well designed, lots of input and output op options and uh, peripherals and stuff like that. Also very graphically capable computer for its day. So really nice to own an example of one of those, not just because it's a great machine, but also because of that historical aspect as well. I also have uh, an Acorn Electron, which is tucked away up here. Uh, this is another one that's very important to me. Um, and these two are actually compatible with each other um, to some extent. Uh, the Acorn Electron was essentially kind of the cut down home version of the BBC Micro uh, and was the very first computer that we ever owned uh, as a family. Uh, so some of my first kind of text adventure experiences and, and, and gaming and that kind of stuff was actually on the Acorn Electron. Uh, and to represent that I have a bit of a collection here of the Acorn Soft games. Uh, a lot of these, uh, Boxer and um, Sphinx Adventure and, and stuff like that are games. Starship Command was another a favourite when I was when I was very young. Uh, you know, they're examples of games that I played as a kid, so it's really nice to have those. 
uh, of course, Elite, fantastic title. Uh, that one actually passed me by back in the day. Uh, to be fair, I was probably a bit too young for it anyway. Um, but yeah, Elite, a really legendary game on the BBC. Uh, so nice boxed example of that as well. And the other thing I have here, of course, is the Acorn Archimedes. And this is the A305, which was the very first Acorn Archimedes. And it was the very first computer to use an ARM CPU. And this was released back in 1987. And Acorn actually invented the ARM uh, CPU. Of course, it originally stood for uh, Acorn Risk Machine. And it's the CPU that's now in your mobile phone and in uh, all sorts of different things. The new Apple Silicon, uh, the Apple laptops and stuff are using a CPU that was derived essentially from the CPU in this machine back in 1987. Uh, so really, really revolutionary machine this. And something that um, unfortunately I don't really have a personal connection to. And to be fair, I think I've probably um, gone as far as I can with it, uh, as far as restoring and upgrading and playing with it is concerned. And it's probably one that's going to be sold very soon, um, just to make some more room in here for the kind of stuff that uh, I do have a bit more of a personal connection to, uh, which is kind of, uh, like I said earlier, the theme that I'm kind of working towards. So uh, yes, if you uh, know anyone who wants to buy a very heavily upgraded original Archimedes, uh, get in touch and maybe we can do a deal. Also have uh, some nice magazines here, obviously Risk User Magazine and Archive, which were both magazines uh, dedicated to the Archimedes. Uh, and just a few examples here of some of the kind of the games on the system. I just bought these really to demo it and show it off for the videos that I made on it. Um, but yeah, some of the best versions of those games in my opinion. Um, obviously the uh, Archimedes was a much more capable machine than the Atari ST or even the Amiga. Um, so good to, uh, good to show those off uh, in all their glory. And now to the complete opposite side of the world for my Famicom collection. Now, if you've seen my previous tour video that I did back in March last year, um, I had a lot more Famicom stuff than this. Um, I had uh, pretty much a whole wall dedicated to it, and I've really thinned this out a lot. And the reason for that is um, on the Japanese auction sites, you can pick up these boxed Famicom games for not a lot of money at all. Obviously, the shipping uh, is something that you have to take into account. Um, but the fact of the matter is, obviously, if you're buying kind of lots and lots of them, um, the shipping kind of averages out over all of them and they still end up being very cheap. So I bought a lot of them um, just for the sake of it, just because I hadn't really had any experience of the uh, NES or, or the Famicom, of course. And uh, it was just a console that I wanted to kind of experience and, and have that proper authentic experience. And I knew that uh, if I did import those games that uh, I'd be able to sell them on and, and I have since sold them on. Um, so I thought, why not? Let's uh, let's import a load of Famicom stuff. Uh, I also used to do composite mods on these and sell them on eBay. And I do still have a few uh, in the loft uh, that I really need to sort out and finish modding uh, and just get moved on. Um, there's also a guide to that on my website, which is uh, by far the most popular page on my website as well. Um, but I have uh, quite a few interesting Famicom items here. So I've got the original Power Glove. Nintendo Entertainment System. Now you and the games are one. The power glove. Everything else is child's play. I've got the data recorder and the family basic. Uh, so you could actually turn the console into basically an 8-bit home computer uh, and do some programming on it and uh, save that to cassette, uh, which is uh, something that didn't make it to the NES in the West, uh, something that was exclusive to the Famicom, uh, as was the disk system, which were, of course, the disk-based games. Uh, I also have the Famicom robot, which was branded as a Rob in the West, uh, but uh, in uh, Japan it was just called the Family Computer Robot and uh, the two games that go with that, uh, which I believe are Gyrodyne and uh, Stacking, um, which were of course also released in the West. And the Family Computer Robot is definitely something that I want to cover in a future video. I know I keep saying this, uh, and to be honest, it's probably something I'm gonna move on, uh, same as uh, the other stuff 
uh, once I've covered it in that video because there's not really much point in just having it sitting around on a shelf. It has no nostalgia value for me in particular. Uh, but again, uh, it's something that I bought with the channel in mind and something that uh, I think would make for a really interesting video. So definitely want to cover that at some point. There's also the gun, uh, the light gun and the story that goes with that, uh, the huge pain that it was to import that uh, and how uh, the uh, Japanese auction site service that I use uh, decided that it was an imitation firearm and uh, refused to export it from Japan until I argued with them quite a lot. Uh, but thankfully it did eventually arrive and yet again it's, a, it's something that I want to cover because there were some quite interesting light gun games on the system and it's a really cool looking thing. And speaking of light guns, I'm sure you haven't failed to notice the light gun that I have here with the Atari XEGS. Of course that came packaged with that console as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and the really interesting thing about this kind of little display here is that uh, this is the computer that kind of started it all for Atari as far as their home computer division is concerned. Uh, so released in 1979, this is the Atari 800. Uh, it was released alongside the 400 which had the uh, not so good membrane keyboard. Uh, and I just have some examples of some of the accessories for this system here. So I've got the original cassette uh, cassette player, which is the Atari 410, uh, the 810 5 and a quarter inch disk drive, uh, the trackball for it, uh, that was a very kind gift to me from uh, Neil at RMC uh, when I went to visit him last year in his uh, in his cave, in his YouTube studio. Uh, this uh, touchpad thing, which is completely useless to me, but uh, I just thought it was really cool and it was quite cheap. So I've also got a bit of a collection of the games and the cartridges for this machine. Uh, but the interesting thing about this and the XEGS is that, uh, like I say, this was the first of Atari's 8-bit home computers, uh, and this was the last computer in that range, or shall I say console in that range, um, or, because although it does have a keyboard, it was very much marketed as a console, uh, but it ran all of the Atari 8-bit home uh, conversions of uh, all of those cool arcade games and stuff. So. Uh, yeah, a bit of a, a slice of history there and uh, an interesting couple of examples of Atari 8-bit machines. And so moving down to the bottom shelf now, we have PCs. Lots and lots of PCs, as I'm sure you can see. Uh, and we got our first family PC in 1994, and it was a 486DX266, uh, uh, and shortly after that it was upgraded to a DX4100. Uh, this machine here is actually kind of a kind of a recreation, kind of an homage to that original family PC that we had. This is a DX4100. It also has uh, an Orpheus uh, sound card in it, which is uh, obviously uh, obviously we didn't have back in the day. We had a, an ESS audio drive. Um, and this, as you'll probably have spotted if you are British and of a certain age, this is an RMX school PC. Uh, and these were really popular in schools in the uh, in the 90s uh, in, uh, in Britain. Um, and that's where a lot of people re recognize that from. A lot of people think that it's an RM Nimbus, but in fact it isn't. It's uh, an RM window box, which was the uh, successor to the Nimbus. Um, but uh, yeah, all of my other PCs here, we have the uh, Pentium 233 MMX, which was featured in my S3 Verge video. That also has a uh, Righteous 3D, uh, Orchid Righteous 3D Voodoo card in it. Uh, so I would love to make a video all about the uh, history of the Voodoo cards at some point in the future. Uh, and in fact, I actually recently found my old Voodoo 3 um, from when I was a teenager. So uh, it would be interesting to, interesting to cover that, I think. Next to that, uh, we have the uh, Pentium 4 NetVista, which I won in the uh, RMC charity auction last year. A really cool PC this. I've quite heavily upgraded this since I got it. Uh, it's kind of a very similar spec now to uh, the first PC that I built with my own money um, back when I was at college. So it's a Pentium 4, 2.8 gigahertz. Um, it's got a uh, GeForce FX 5700 card. Just next to that, um, we've got all the accessories for the NetVista. That's a nice early example of a, an IBM TFT screen there. And of course the infamous set of speakers, the 2.1 speakers made by the Jazz Hipster Corporation. Uh, next to that, another IBM, of course, the iconic IBM 5150, which was the first ever DOS PC, uh, released in 1981. I made a couple of videos about that on my channel. Uh, that's quite heavily upgraded. I also have a, has a, uh, an overclocking solution in it called the PC Sprint, which I also uh, made a video about. Uh, links will be down in the description for any other videos that I mention in this particular tour, if you're interested. And then of course the RM monitor which goes with the RM machine. And next to that is something that hasn't really been featured on my channel or anywhere yet. And that is a slot A Athlon 650 machine. Uh, and that again is a, a, an actual X uh, family PC of ours which I, I rescued from my parents loft. 
um, and it's uh, it's yeah, it's an Athlon, Athlon 650 um, megahertz. It's the slot A. Uh, it's a Thunderbird uh, processor. And uh, I think it will be interesting to make a video at some point in the future about the uh, the history of the the kind of the slot processors, and, and, and obviously uh, Intel had the slot one, and, and Athlon had the slot A, and that kind of interesting period in history, uh, and how that came about, and and, and why. Um, so you never know; that might be appearing at some point. Uh, that's kind of a uh, obviously like a Half-Life Deus Ex kind of era machine, which is absolutely right at my street, my era. Um, fantastic little machine that, so it will be interesting to cover it at some point in the future. Over to this side of the room now, and if you watched my previous tour last year, uh, these are what I used to refer to as my Atari shelves, and basically because I had my complete Atari collection out on display. Um, as you can probably tell, it's uh, kind of outgrown this area now, so uh, this, this has been used uh, just as storage until quite recently. I had a load of tools and just a load of mess on here. Uh, finally decided to sort it out, which is kind of what prompted the uh, recording of this updated tour. Um, so we'll start with the bottom shelf. Uh, here we have the uh, Dreamcast, of course, uh, iconic console by Sega. And um, I didn't actually have a Dreamcast uh, back when they were brand, brand new. I had a couple of friends who had them uh, and I played on them quite a lot. Um, but because I was basically always around their houses, I just uh, just basically didn't splash out on one because uh, it didn't really seem worth having my own. Uh, so this is my actual one from back in the day that I picked up uh, when the Dreamcast was discontinued and they were actually selling these stuff off pretty cheap. Um, and a few of these games are mine. Obviously, I borrowed a lot of games back in the day and also uh, it was very easy to play copied games on the Dreamcast. Um, so I don't have a huge amount of them. Some of them are, are mine that I picked up uh, at the time when they were, when they were cheap. Uh, some of them are games that uh, a friend of mine basically uh, donated to me uh, when he sold his Dreamcast off. So uh, fantastic console, one of my favourites of all time. Not really sure what the longer term plan is for this. Uh, it's let down a little bit by the uh, the video output, but then of course there are modern day upgrades uh, as per the Xbox, uh, where you can add the HDMI and stuff like that to it. So perhaps a potential future project there. It does have a GDMU in it, which is a um, an SD card interface that allows you to load games from SD card, uh, which is how I use it nowadays. Obviously those old drives are kind of starting to fail now. So uh, it's fantastic to have that as a nice, reliable, modern option. So just moving up to the next shelf, uh, there's something here that you might be a little bit surprised to see, uh, knowing that I'm kind of into my more uh, retro stuff and original hardware, and that is the Evercade. Now, this is something that I, I resisted for the longest time because I just thought I just thought it seemed really gimmicky and a bit pointless. Um, and I was also a bit suspicious that uh, a lot of big YouTubers seemed to suddenly uh, have these land in their laps and uh, suddenly started putting out glowing reviews of it. So yeah, I resisted it for the longest time, but after having spoken to a few people that actually own them, I, I kind of started to warm to the idea. Um, and I was, I was just browsing through eBay uh, a month or so ago, and uh, someone seemed to be selling off their entire collection. So I thought, why not? I'll buy it. Uh, it was a reasonable price. Um, you know, I, I, if I didn't get on with it, I could just part it out and, and sell all the bits individually. Um, and uh, probably easily make my money back and maybe even make a bit of profit as well. So uh, it seemed like quite a low risk way of trying it out. And actually, I have to say, I've been really impressed with this and I'm going to be doing a proper review on this pretty soon. Um, if you're not familiar with the Evercade, uh, it's made by a British company called Blaze. It was released uh, last year and it's uh, basically collections, curated collections of games on cartridge. So each of these cartridges will have um, kind of four or five or maybe up to ten games on them and uh, you've got a good mixture here of arcade classics from the likes of Namco and Atari and uh, some of the big names in the arcade uh, industry. Uh, you've also got uh, more recently Worms, there's a Worms collection, I think that was the most recent cartridge to come out so uh, I actually bought the latest two cartridges brand new. And uh, it's an emulator so it's an ARM based uh, handheld, um, it just runs a uh, version of Linux I think and uh, you stick the cartridge in you play the games. and you would think, well, okay, well, why not use something like a, a PSP or a PS Go or a, a Vita or something like that? Um, and like I say, it's uh, it, it's not it's not really about the uh, it's not really about having the actual games and playing the actual games. Although the selection of games is excellent and and, and the level of emulation is is very very good as well. It's more a collector thing, you know, some people collect stamps, some people collect coins, uh, people collect Funko Pops and all sorts of stuff. And this is uh, you know a very nicely uh, sort of curated collection of games and things. And now I'm starting to sound like one of those YouTubers that was sent this thing for free um, and singing its praises. But that's something that I want to cover in a bit more depth in a proper review. And I'll do I'll do a load of game captures as well and just compare um, 
just compare the various different games available on here and, and kind of show them compared to their originals uh, and just see kind of what they look like. But as a whole, excellent piece of hardware, really nice buttons and D-pad and stuff on there, uh, really well put together and uh, relatively cheap to collect for as well. So uh, actually, uh, as a system for collectors, I'm, like I say, I'm, I'm actually on board with it now. So this is something that probably needs no introduction, and I'm sure you've probably already spotted it. Uh, it's the N64, of course. And uh, this I actually imported myself from Japan. And the reason I bought this uh, was was kind of as a, a bit of a cynical marketing ploy for the channel, actually. Um, and I, I was in the very, very early days of my YouTube channel, I was thinking, what can I do to kind of draw some attention to myself and, and trying to get some subscribers and, and build stuff up? And I thought, what I could do is, like, you know, I can import this, uh, RGB modify it, make a video about it, and then give it away in a competition. And as you can probably tell, that competition didn't happen. Uh, and the reason for that was I kind of got cold feet about it all. Um, I asked a few people online and people were saying, well, you know, it's uh, it, it's cheating the system a bit and uh, YouTube kind of frowns upon it and you, you don't want to kind of fall foul of their, their competition regulations and stuff. And uh, I really went off the idea. And the thing about the N64 is that I didn't own one back in the day, so it's not really something that I have much uh, kind of nostalgic love for. Um, I had one friend who had one and we kind of played um, obviously the usual stuff, GoldenEye and Mario 64 and that kind of thing, but it was just never a console that really, really appealed to me at the time. Um, so I think what I'll do, um, I have the RGB mod board ready to go in and I will still be doing that modification and making a video about it. Um, but uh, yeah, longer term, I think uh, once that's done and I've uh, obviously uh, put together a bit of a video about these games and, and maybe compared them to the uh, to the worldwide releases, if there's any differences, I'm not really sure. It's not something I've uh, put uh, much research into yet. Um, I'll probably be shifting this one on like a lot of stuff. Uh, whether I'll still go ahead with that competition, I'm not sure. Uh, whether I'll just sell it on eBay, uh, we'll have to see. But the Japanese version of the N64 boxes, obviously really colorful. Uh, they look really nice on the shelf. So uh, if nothing else, it's made for a nice little display in the meantime. So last but by no means least, uh, just some reading material upon this shelf. And uh, so these are IBM manuals. Uh, these were mostly imported from the US when I got my IBM 5150. So I've got the original manuals for that, uh, the original version of DOS, uh, or I think that's, that one's actually a slightly later version, that's 2.1, uh, basic 3.0, um, operations and technical manuals and stuff. And the cool thing about these is that uh, they go into quite a lot of technical detail, um, all, all about how the actual hardware works and uh, memory addresses and registers and schematics. And, uh, you know, even I think even the source code for the BIOS um, is in one of them. So, uh, yeah, not like the uh, computer manuals of today. And they're in these really nice uh, high quality ring binders, which are very cool to look at, very cool to uh, own. And uh, yeah, very interesting to flick through as well. And next to those, uh, my ST formats, uh, which I actually bought these as a complete set um, not that long ago, um, well, maybe six months ago or so. And these were actually bought from a subscriber who uh, must have subscribed from day one and uh, actually uh, went through pretty much all the way through to the end of the publication of this magazine. So this is a British computer magazine dedicated to the Atari ST, uh, published by Future Publishing. Uh, and I did a recent video on this when I was actually, where I was actually flicking through a promo copy uh, that was very kindly donated to the channel. And because I got these from a subscriber, I also have all of the subscriber exclusive uh, newsletters and uh, cover discs and stuff that came with these as well. So really, really good find that. Uh, and they're in really nice condition. A couple of the binders are kind of starting to fall apart, but the, uh, the magazines themselves are in really nice condition. And uh, just tucked away at the back here, uh, we have Atari User, which is uh, kind of a, an older Atari magazine, which is actually dedicated to the 8-bit machines. So uh, very interesting to uh, flick through those and, and just kind of see uh, the the 80s and, and kind of the 8-bit uh, the era that uh, I kind of missed growing up. I was just uh, ever so slightly too young for that. Um, so yeah, interesting pe period in Atari history and a uh, nice little uh, library of magazines here. Longer term, I actually want to do some videos where I flick through these and just kind of focus on some specific things, but um, yeah, for now, just uh, interesting reference material. Quite, I do actually read them occasionally um, and interesting to look at the, uh, the old game reviews and stuff like that and maybe get some ideas for stuff to do with my Ataris. And so that brings us to the end of the tour. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, slightly more off the cuff unscripted style of video from my channel. Of course, uh, normal service will resume next time. 
Um, if you've seen anything at all that's piqued your interest or uh, anything that you have any questions about or maybe suggestions on how I can cover some stuff uh, in some future videos like I've suggested, uh, I would very much appreciate that feedback. I do read every single comment on my videos and I do re reply to the, the vast majority of them as well, um, if, they're, uh, if they're positive anyway. And uh, yeah, so if you enjoyed this, uh, please do give it a thumbs up. Uh, it really helps me to grow the channel and improve the visibility of my videos. If you're not subscribed already uh, and you want to see retro gaming, vintage computer and uh, electronics stuff from me, uh, please do hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on that. So finally, uh, all that's left is to thank you very much for watching, as always, and I'll see you again next time.